all of you who are interested in Dhamma, I'd like to express my appreciation that you have come here in this way, that is, for the purpose of discovering Dhamma. I'd like to spend a little time considering how it is that this time is the most appropriate for exploring the Dhamma. Most flowers bloom or open in the very early morning. And in the same way, this is a good time for our hearts to open and bloom. Later in the day, we're so busy, so occupied, there are so many things going around in our minds, that it's, it's like our teacup is filled or even overflowing. But early in the morning, our teacup isn't yet full. There's still room to pour in a little something new. This is why we have chosen this time of day as the most appropriate for discussing and investigating Dhamma. Another thing worth observing is that the Buddha awakened or was enlightened at this time of day. It's time for us to develop an understanding of what studying Dhamma is about. What the reason and purpose for studying Dhamma is so that life will be developed so that life will be developed to its highest degree or highest potential. This development of life is what studying Dhamma is about. <clears throat> you must be certain about certain things. You must be certain that Dhamma is the thing which will develop life or which can develop our lives. Second, we must be certain that life can be developed. And further, you must be certain that life can be developed to the highest level or to the supreme level, what we could call the supreme life. It's important for us to be certain about these things so that we are truly committed and motivated so that we have a strong appetite for studying and practicing Dhamma. We, life has been given to us by nature, or if you prefer, by God, as our basic stakes or capital. Life itself is our basic capital. And then we, we work with that capital by developing life. Just as a businessman will invest his capital in order to earn a profit. In the same way, we develop life so that our life is profitable, is worthwhile. Otherwise, life is wasted. If we aren't able to turn a profit on our basic investment of life, then we've wasted our lives. We just wander around aimlessly, not doing anything worthwhile or having benefited or learned from being a human being. When we talk of a highest life or supreme life, here, what we mean is a life that is above and beyond all problems. When life is still immersed in or caught up in problems, then there are all these things that need, need to be dealt with and solved. But when life has been developed to a level that it is the highest level, it's above all problems. It's 
freed from the problems of ordinary worldly existence. What are the problems? What are the things that disturb and hassle our hearts? We should observe the fact and the activity of or the influence of all the different dualistic things, all the things which come in pairs, such as positive and negative, and see that these are the things that disturb the mind. These disturb the mind, and because of that disturbance, there is pain or suffering, what we call dukkha. When we say that both the positive, both positive and negative, are problems equally. This is often difficult for people to understand and to accept. We can try and make this a little more clearer by saying that both gladness and sadness are equally problems for us. If we examine gladness, we see that gladness is not peaceful just as just as much as sadness is not peaceful if we observe them carefully we'll see that neither gladness nor sadness is peaceful therefore they are considered problems which disturb us this is easier to see when we genuinely seek peace in life then we start to notice the things that interfere with a truly peaceful life. Or to put it in terms that children can understand, we can say that both laugh, laughing and crying are equally painful. When we laugh, it tires us and crying tires us. Laughter is exciting, stimulating. Crying is exciting and stimulating. Both laughter and tears stimulate, confuse, and tire us. They're equally problems. Both of these are too much. They're, they're too much trouble. They're not worth the trouble. And so we can say that both laughing and crying are problems. If then one begins to want to be free, when one definitely clearly desires freedom, then one sees that one can't be free until one is free or beyond both crying and laughing. Crying bites our heart. Laughter also bites our heart just as much as crying does. Any kind of loving, loving bites our heart. Not loving equally bites our heart. The thing is to be beyond both loving and not loving, to be free of this duality of loving and not loving. The problem is nowadays, however, we worship the positive. We worship a life that's dedicated to bigger, better, to more and more positive ideas and attainments. We fall in love with things because of our addiction to the positive. And because of our mad scramble after the positive, we've built a world that is full of problems, social, environmental, sexual, and otherwise. We've got so many problems that we're unable to solve them because of our infatuation with the positive. The way to make a beginning of dealing with all the problems we've created 
is to let go of the positive, to drop or outgrow our obsessions, our addictions with the positive in order to be free. And only from a position of freedom or a non-position of freedom can we begin to respond properly and wisely to the chaos of modern life. To put it even more simply, we can say that what we're after is life where we, where we neither need to fight nor flee. Life where there's neither struggle nor running away. Some people will wonder, if we don't fight, how can we succeed? How can we win? We need to point out that winning or victory is yet another aspect of the positive. It's another positive thing that we, we cling to. Pot, winning is just the opposite of losing. And to be free, we need to be free of both of them. So what we're after is being free of both winning and losing. If we win, we get caught up and trapped in that. If we lose, then we losing is the opposite where we the struggle is too much for us, the fighting overwhelms us, and then we lose. Either way, winning or losing, fighting or fleeing is not worth the trouble. Neither winning nor losing is peaceful. There is no, no peace can be found in winning, nor can it be found in losing. So we're looking for something that is beyond both winning and losing, where we've let go of both winning and losing. Or another important pair is good and evil. If we go and attach to either good or evil, they'll bite us in claws. To get a, to a, cling to the good bites and hassles us just as bad, just as much as clinging to the bad. To cling to the good creates all kinds of confusion and chaos, just as much as clinging to the bad, to the evil, clinging to evil does. We think that clinging to good is, is better than clinging to evil, but we overlook that they're equally, the results are equally chaotic and equally unpeaceful. <clears throat> So to really understand what Dhamma is about, to be clear about the purpose of studying and practicing Dhamma, we need to understand that clinging to good and clinging to evil are both hassles, creates both clinging to either one, creates problems, and that the thing is to be free of both to let go of both good and evil. This kind of wisdom has been known to humanity for thousands of years. It's nothing new. For example, in the far west of Asia, in Palestine, the Jews understood this. In the early pages of the Old Testament, of the Christian Bible, of the Bible, there's the passage where God forbids Adam and Eve to eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God warned them not to eat this fruit of knowing good and evil or that they would die. So here in the early pages of the Old Testament, it's very clear that being under the influence of good and evil leads to spiritual death. 
Then on the other side of Asia, in the far east of Asia, in China, Lao Tzu, the first person to teach Taoism, taught to not get caught up in yin and yang, to not attach to yin and yang. Here again, yin and yang include or symbolize all the dualities, such as positive and negative, good and evil, male and female, and so on. And the message then is the same, not to cling to good and evil. Then in the middle of Asia, in India, where both the Hindu and the Buddhist tradition began, we find the same message. In Hindu, it's ex- the old Hindu tradition expressed it in terms of punya and papa. Punya and papa is essentially the same. Merit and sin, or, or virtue and sin, or good and evil again. In Buddhism, the preferred terms are gusala and agusala, wholesome and unwholesome the way they're usually translated. But it comes down once again to good and evil, positive and negative. The human race has discovered this wisdom thousands of years ago, that if we cling to good and evil, if our minds are trapped, are influenced by good and evil, then it will create pain. It makes existence painful miserable. It causes dukkha. This knowledge has been with us for thousands of years. So how are things nowadays? What is our situation these days? It seems quite clear that nowadays modern humanity worships the positive far more than ever before in human history, far more than our humanity, um, primitive humanity that still lived in the forests and hills. We nowadays worship the positive so much that we spend all of our time, all of our time, doing things that will make us happy, that will make us laugh. Our goal in life is just to find pleasure and to do things that make us laugh, to be entertained. This is what we take to be important in the modern world. This, and so we've created industrial systems technologies and economies that are designed to produce consumer products. All kinds of lots of money, energy and technology and resources go into producing things that's, which have the sole purpose of bringing us pleasure and entertaining us, of making us laugh. And we worship these things. And so nowadays our situation is that we live in a world dominated by the positive. We, we bow down and worship the positive. Whatever we take to be positive, we seek after it. And the result is, of that is the tremendous competition that afflicts all modern societies people whose whole life is dedicated to struggling and competing for the things that entertain and amuse us. We fight and struggle so that now there are all sorts of conflicts on all levels of society and between nations. There's always a new war erupting somewhere because of this struggle and competition for what we worship as positive. 
And although we blindly pursue the positive with such great effort, the result is that we're always immersed in the negative. Because we don't understand how this works, we keep chasing after the positive and bring the negative down upon us. We want the positive, but we keep ending up with all kinds of negative things and experiences. This is our, our modern situation. Because we don't understand the situation we're in, we worship all this technology in industry. We even worship and honor the fighting in competition. We think that the chaos and excitement is the meaning of life. Because we don't understand this situation we're in, we then create more and more a society of conflict, of injustice, and of abuse of other human beings, other life forms, and, and nature. Because of our luck, lack of understanding, we worship the positive and have gotten into this kind of situation. It's important to understand the root causes of the problems we've created if we are going to begin to, to solve them. It's, all of these things are a result of us worshipping the positive far too much, far too excessively. Most children, as well as most adults, when they hear these words that we need to be above both positive and negative, when they hear these words they'll think we're crazy. Most human, most adults, when they hear this, think we're, that we're abnormal. We're talking about something abnormal, weird, or crazy. This is because we've been trained, programmed, you could even say brainwashed since we are young, that we need to be successful. We need to achieve, to attain, to get whatever we take to be good or positive. We're taught this way from, from when we're very young. And so we're totally biased or locked into that way of thinking. And so when we hear someone saying that the, the real way to live, the wise way to live, is to be above the positive, just as much as we need to be above the negative. Everybody can understand why we need to be free of the negative, of evil. But we need to see that we just as much need to be free of the positive. So to really get anywhere, so before we go any further, you need to be very clear is what we're talking about crazy or not? Is what we're saying sane and healthy or is it stupid and crazy? This is something you need to, to find out very quickly. Most people believe that religion teaches us to get the best thing there is in life, to achieve the sunambanam, or the utmost goodness. Most people understand that religion is to realize, achieve, get the highest good, the sunambanam. But if we examine all the religious, the true religious teachings carefully, with sensitivity, then we'll see things differently. For example, the Jewish tradition from which arose both the Christian tradition and the Islamic tradition makes very clear in the very first pages of their scriptures that God 
commanded all humanity to be free of good and evil, to not eat of that fruit, to be beyond the influence of good and evil. The same happened in the Far East with Lao Tzu and in India with Hinduism and Buddhism. The old Brahmin teachings and then the later Hindu teachings teach that if we let go of both punya and papa, both good and evil, then we can merge in the eternal soul. One, one can realize the eternal soul. Buddhism teaches that by letting go of all positive and negative, all of all wholesome and unwholesome things, that that is nibbana, perfect peace, coolness. All the traditions, therefore, teach transcending, getting, being released from positive and negative, from good and evil. There's not one genuine religion that teaches us to cling to the good, to seek only the good or the highest good. So please hold to the teaching from the Bible that says, don't eat the fruit of the tree that causes us to know good and evil. This teaching is most profound. Please, <clears throat> please take it very seriously. It teaches us not to classify or regard anything as good or evil. Any event or experience in your life, anything that comes into your life, don't label it, classify it, or regard it as being good or evil. Instead, just ask yourself what to do about it, how to respond to it, how to cope with it. When something happens in life, everything that happens in life, just look at the causes and conditions of things. Where does it come from? What are its circumstances, its causes? And then ask, what should we do about it? How do we respond? That's all. That's all we need to do. Don't let good and evil, positive and negative, get in the way or confuse things. That would just, good and evil, thinking that this is good and that is bad, would just mess things up. All we need to know is what's going on, how it happened, and what we ought to do about it. This is the meaning, the significance of the very, the most profound teaching in the Bible. Since most of you come from a Christian culture and background, this should be easier for you to understand than the Buddhist formulation of things. So, especially those who are committed Christians, please take Christianity to its highest degree and put this first teaching of God into, into practice. Then you'll be a true Christian. And once you're a true Christian, you'll automatically be a true Buddhist at the same time. Because this, this teaching is both the heart of Christianity and the heart of Buddhism. Don't, don't eat the fruit of the tree that causes us to know good and evil. <clears throat> Don't waste your time trying to strike a balance between good and evil. Just trying to balance them will be a hopeless and not at all rewarding task. Or don't try to just stay in the middle 
between good and evil. That will never work and you'll just find yourself being burnt at both ends. <coughs> the way to deal with good and evil is to go beyond both of them. Instead of being between them or trying to balance them, be above them both. Be beyond both good and evil. This is where one can find freedom, peace, and meaning in life. To come to study the Dhamma, to practice Dhamma, one needs to be, to have this understanding. If there's anybody who thinks that being beyond good and evil, being above positive and negative, that this has no meaning, that it's abnormal, that it's lifeless or boring, or that it's crazy. Anyone who thinks like that, there's really not any reason for you to be here. There's no point in us talking about things because there's no common ground. And there's, there's not really much point in trying to practice Dhamma if one doesn't see any value, doesn't see the importance of being beyond both good and evil. That's why we've taken the time to discuss this in some detail. Some of our friends who are Christian tell us that God is the utmost good, the highest good. And we tell them, no, that's impossible. If there is really a God, God must be beyond good. If you're going to really call it God. If, if God is merely the highest good or the utmost good, there's no way that that could be a real God. It's just another figment of human imagination. For something to deserve the, the name God, it must be beyond good. But they can't accept this. They insisted that God is the utmost good. And so in the end, we don't have much to talk about because there's, there's no room for understanding. Some people wonder what value or benefit there is in a life which is beyond both positive and negative, beyond above both good and evil. They think, you know, what good is it? We will insist that this life itself is the supreme life, that the true meaning of life is being beyond and above both good and evil. This is what we'll talk about next. The life that is free of both good and evil is the highest life. When we speak of the highest life, it must have two characteristics or qualities. First of all, it must be blissful. And second, it must be useful. For life to deserve the, the adjective highest, to call it the highest or supreme life, it must be both blissful and useful. And the only way for life to be both blissful and useful is for it to be freed of the power of good and evil, to be beyond the influence of good and evil. If we're still clinging to positive and negative, if good and evil still have influence over us, then there's no way that life can be blissful. As long as we worship the positive, then we, we fall into liking and loving things. We're full of prejudices. Life is off balance, always tending to this one extreme. And so there's no peace. As long as we're worshiping the positive, there will be no peace in our life. And without peace, there is no bliss. 
genuine bliss comes only from from genuine peace. So for as long as we're infatuated with the positive or the negative, there's no other way that we can have bliss in our lives. Clinging to pos- or the feeling that of positive and negative, feeling that this is positive, that is negative. This is the fundamental cause of all selfishness. When we cling to the positive or to good, then we are selfish in a good way. What people think is good selfishness. When we cling to the negative, when we attach to to bad, to to evil, then we are selfish in an evil way. But either way, it is selfishness. Whenever we're under the power of positive or negative, it leads to some form of selfishness. We need to understand this so that we can transcend selfishness, egoism, self-centeredness by being free of both positive and negative. Whenever we feel positive about something, we, we like it. We find satisfaction in it. And whenever there is this liking, this satisfaction, it turns into selfishness. This is not something that you need to be told by anyone else. It's something that is quite obvious and clear that each of us can know for ourselves. That whenever we feel positive about something, we start to like it. We start to be satisfied by it. And from that comes the kind of selfishness which is most difficult to understand. Selfishness of the the good kind, a good kind of selfishness. It's hard for us to understand. But when we're clinging to the good, when we this is just coming from a sense of what is positive, what makes us feel good, what satisfies us. We've got this idea that it's good, it's good. But really what's happening is we're being selfish about our own ideas about what makes us feel good. And so we don't think of others at all. We're we're incredibly insensitive to others. We have no concern for what is correct, what is appropriate, what is fitting. We think only we are just selfish, egoistic, according to what is positive, what seems good to us. Because of this, we worship the positive. We love the good. We're obsessed with what we take to be positive and good. And what that means is that our lives are full of selfishness. Whether we want to admit that or not, as long as we're caught in the positive, then there's a whole lot of selfishness going on in our lives. Observe that positive things enslave us. When we feel positive about something, see how it enslaves us. It traps us into a certain kind of selfishness. In fact, the positive or the good enslaves us far more than the negative and the evil. <clears throat> of course, when we cling to the negative, it will entrap us, enslave us also. But the positive, the good, has much more power to enslave us. We should observe this. So in the end, both the positive and the negative, both good and evil, enslave us. They dominate us. They, they run our lives. 
we should consider how this begins. It's instructive to study children, newborns especially. The newborn infant is born and soon after tastes milk, suckles from its mother's breast. And that milk tastes good, feels positive for the, the infant. And the infant's mind, not knowing any better, attaches to that positive. And then later it tastes something else, something bitter or, or whatever. And it, it considers that to be negative, comparing it with what it attaches to as positive. And so very quickly the infant is caught into positive and negative liking the positive, disliking the, the negative. And this way of, ex of discriminating experience, this way of thinking and reacting grows and develops further and further until we're adults who worship the positive and hate the negative. Very, in many ways, very violently our minds going from worship to hatred. This is a, a development we can, we can easily understand of, of how we get enslaved to positive and negative. This is just one example of what happens with young children in their development. When life is dominated and run by the positive and the negative, when positive and negative are pushing and pulling us here and there, all over the place, there's no way that such a life can be blissful or useful. In order to, to live a life that is truly blissful and useful then, we must eliminate the positive and the negative. We must let go of the positive and negative and live a life that is beyond them. When you come here to study the Dhamma and to practice meditation, it's solely for the purpose of, of living life above and beyond positive and negative. What we're learning and what we're practicing has solely this purpose. Now, even if you're, you aren't able to do this completely in the time that you're here. You should be able to understand well enough what needs to be done and how to do it. So that after you leave, you can keep developing your understanding and practicing it in your lives. So that one day, eventually, one's life is freed of, of positive and negative. This is the purpose in coming here. So we hope that your study and practice will enable you to know what you need to do and how to do it so that you, your life can be developed as high as possible until it is beyond positive and negative, good and evil. So even if you came here as a tourist, you came to Thailand and then to Amok as a tourist, may you leave as a pilgrim, a pilgrim that carries in your backpack the knowledge and wisdom of how to live free of good and evil. There are two matters of importance here. The first is to know what's going on, to know what's happening in life, to understand the, the, the basic facts of our existence, of how positive and negative arise, how we attach to them, how this creates liking and disliking, and that leads to selfishness, 
and then all of our problems follow from that. This is the first matter to understand how all that works. Then the second matter is to deal with that, to practice in the right way so that we can get free of all that positive and negative, all the reacting and attaching associated with it. Even if we understand what all this business of positive and negative attaching to it and so on, it doesn't mean we're able to get free of it. So the second matter is knowing how to practice to get free, to to cope with this addiction to positive and negative. So there are these two basic things to to discover here. We will do what we can to help you to to understand this. So first, we must all study the law of dependent origination, which explains how positive and negative arise and how that turns into how through attachment that turns into selfishness, which is the pro- which creates all the problems, all the hassles, all the pain and misery in life. We need to understand that, and then we need to know how to practice anapanasati, or mindfulness with breathing, so that through this kind of meditation, we develop the ability to, to get free of the positive and negative. These are the things that we will, that we try to help you with here. These are the two necessary things that we need to understand. To understand here means that we know what's happening, what to do about it, and how to do it. It probably won't be possible to be 100% successful in what we're talking about within only 10 days. It's doubtful that anybody can complete this within 10 days. But it is possible to know what needs to be done and how so that we can continue working on it. So that we, if we understand what it is and how, what um, mindfulness with breathing is, and we know how to do it, then we can continue developing our mind until one day we are able to transcend positive and negative. Probably nobody can do this within 10 days, but if we learn here what to do, and then we, we work upon it consistently, if we keep trying, then one day we can do it. What we're, all we're trying to do here is to pull ourselves out of slavery to positive and negative, to the self, and to the, to pull us out from the selfishness, to free ourselves from the selfishness that arises due to positive and negative. We hope that you can understand what needs to be done so that you can work on this until you are fully successful. You won't be able to know anything completely just by studying it. The kind of knowledge that comes from what we call study will never be complete. It's a start, but to make our understanding complete whole and sufficient, we need to practice. It's through practice that understanding really blossoms and becomes sufficient to solve our problems. So we begin by discussing, by listening, in order that we have the kind of understanding and knowledge that comes from study. But then we must practice. We must put that study knowledge into practice so that the knowledge is fully understood, so that the facts, the realities are truly known. Then we are, we are successful.
So we begin with study, but then we take that study and put it into practice. Now even the study must be more profound than is than usually happens. To just study from talks or books is not to really study something. To really study is to study something in its reality. Instead of just reading words and ideas, theories in a book, study these things in life itself. Study the reality of things as they actually happen. This means not even to study from memory, from what happened last year, but to study from what's happening now, today. This is what it means to truly study something, to study things in, in themselves, not in the ideas and theories. This is the kind of study that goes together with practice. When we put something into practice, then we have the opportunity to study it in this way. This means to study in our own life, in our own experience, now, what is positive, what is negative, how do they arise, how do we cling to the positive, how do we cling to the negative, how does, the, how does this lead to, how does this positive bite us, how does the positive turn into a mad dog that bites us, how does negative become a rabid dog that bites us. How does this lead to selfishness? What is that selfishness like? What does that selfishness do to life? What kind of life do we lead when it's, when it's at the center of life is selfishness, self-centeredness, egoism? What are the results of all this? What kind of world does it make? To study this is to study it in our own life, in our own experience, as it unfolds. This is how to really study something. In Buddhism, the thing which is considered to be the worst, the most evil, the ugliest, the most disgusting, the most sinful, the most satanic, is selfishness. The selfishness which comes from attaching to positive and negative. The one who has selfishness gets bit, suffers because of that selfishness. The, the one who is selfish suffers for it. And then when there is selfishness, it also reaches out to bite others, harms others and makes them suffer. Selfishness harms and bites both the one who is selfish and the ones around that person. This is why we consider selfishness to be the, the most wicked, evil, ugly, sinful, and dangerous thing there is. So we need to work together to eliminate selfishness in ourselves. When there is no selfishness in us, then we are blissful. And to work together to eliminate selfishness in others, this is what it is to be useful. When we can eliminate selfishness both in ourselves and in others, then our lives are both blissful and useful. Selfishness arises instinctually in human beings. In children, we taste something and it's delicious. We taste something else and it's not delicious, it tastes bad. And then that positive, that very ordinary positive and negative gets attached to and selfishness arises regarding what tastes good and what tastes bad. This happens instinctually in young children, but then the kind of societies we have, the kind of educations we have, our economies, our cultures, surround children with all kinds of things to trick them into more and more selfishness. Our world is full of things which 
are designed to make us greedy and selfish, to make us hateful and prejudiced. And so this basic instinctual selfishness is developed. It's surrounded and encouraged to grow and grow. And so as we grow older, we are more and more selfish. Our lives are more firmly established in selfishness. So there are these two kinds of selfishness. There's the instinctual, and then there's the, the learned or the, the cultivated, the acculturated selfishness. The more we sustain life on positive things, the more selfish we'll be, become. The more we depend on positive things, the more our lives depend on or are conditioned by selfishness. So we need to be very careful about all this. We need to be careful in how we live, what we use to keep ourselves alive, and all that, so that we don't get so trapped and enslaved by positiveness. Our world is getting closer to destruction or at least to some kind of holocaust and more greater and greater tragedies because selfishness is growing very rapidly in our world. You study the newspapers a little bit and you'll see it's full of examples of selfishness being valued more and more. That being more and more attached, the world is more and more fighting over things that it values and selfishness is justified, supported, encouraged, even honored, worshipped more and more in this world. And for this reason, the tragedies, the injustices are getting worse and worse, and our, our world is getting closer to its own destruction. The capitalists are selfish. The workers the laborers are selfish. The employers are selfish. The employees are selfish. The governments are selfish. The citizens are selfish. This is the problem that is, this is the crisis that is confronting us in our modern world. Unlimited selfishness abounding everywhere. Because of our great material advancement or development, Life is more and more dependent on the positive. And so people are more and more selfish in competing to get, to have, to keep these material goods and all the things we consider to be positive. This, this unmitigated selfishness, as it grows, is conf confronting us with greater and greater dangers. This is the problem that that faces us. This is our challenge that needs to be to be met and solved. What to do about all this selfishness. The more material advancement, the more industrial and technical development there is, the more selfish we become. The more selfish we become, the more problems there are in life. When the more we create all these positive things to chase after, to possess, the more we become selfish. The more that selfishness de um, dominates and determines our lives, the more that our life bites itself, and the more our lives bite others. In this world of great selfishness, each life is biting itself, gnawing on itself and is fighting and tormenting others at the same time. This is the problem of, of selfishness. We need to understand this and then learn to control our material advancement. This technological development needs to be brought under control so that it doesn't foster selfishness as it does now. We need to learn how to deal with, how to master development 
material, technological, scientific development so that it doesn't create more and more selfishness. We need to know ourselves well and more and more correctly from day to day. We need to understand ourselves much more deeply. We need to see that we can see that there are two kinds of people in the world. Okay, everybody is basically a body and a mind. All of us are essentially body and mind. But one group of people have something extra. They have a third thing, namely selfishness. So for some people there is body, mind, and selfishness. But then there's another group where there's just body and mind and no selfishness. This is the group that doesn't have any problems. This is the group that lives and is peace. So the problem is not having a body and mind. On that we're all the same. The problem is selfishness. Where there is the third thing, in those people life is biting itself and biting others. But where there is just the natural body and mind, all that is necessary for life, then there's no problem. We need to observe, observe more carefully till we understand what life is and to see where the problem lies. Selfishness comes from the feeling that one is or has a self. Selfishness comes from a sense of ego or from egoism at the center of our lives. When we conceive of or attach to life as having a self or being a self, that egoism leads to selfishness. So we need to examine this illusion of selfishness or the illusion behind selfishness and the, the illusion that one is a self or one is an ego in order to see that these, these are warped perspectives. They're a twisted way of looking at life. Egoism and selfishness are just a sick way of, of looking at, at and understanding life. When we can see this, when we can see the insanity of it, then we will find, we'll be able to find the means to get free of it. But until we see through the illusion of self, we'll be dogged and tormented by selfishness but by understanding that what we take to be a self, what we take to be me and mine, is not truly me and mine, then we can be freed from, from selfishness. We need to explore this in reality itself, not just to fool around with philosophy or psycho psychological ideas, but to study this in reality itself, in the experiences that life presents. For example, when the eye sees something, notice how we always take it to be I, not the eye in our face, but the I ego sees this or that. When the ear hears a sound, notice how it's always taken to be I hear a sound. It's not understood that it's just the nervous system receiving some sensory input and then processing it in a way that's suited for the needs of our survival and well-being. But it's always I here. Or instead of when the nose smells some odor, it's I smell something. When the body is touched, it's I am touched or I touch. Even when the mind thinks a thought, it's I am thinking, it's my thinking. We can study in the basic experiences of life, in seeing, hearing, and so on, how 
ego arises, how this sense of me and mine comes in, when there's just the natural functioning of the nervous system to notice how ego comes in, how the self takes over, and then how out of that selfishness arises to start to notice the kind of twisted thinking of selfishness, how it arises towards our basic experiences. We can study this right here in our our own lives, right now. Take an easy example. When a knife cuts our finger, maybe we're peeling something, and the knife slips, slips and cuts our finger. We never experience it as the knife cuts a finger. We always experience it as the knife cut me, or the knife cut my finger. And as soon as ego comes into, you know, the knife cut ego, as soon as the ego comes into the experience, then what follows is really stupid kinds of thinking. Because of the ignorance of this self-thinking, this egoistic thought, then we respond in truly foolish ways. We get angry at the knife like it's the knife's fault, and we throw it or break it. Or we yell at somebody else in the room, scapegoating them or something. As soon as ego comes in, the thinking that follows is, is truly stupid. It's very selfish. It can be very destructive. These Life abounds with little examples like this, because this the ego is not some lasting entity the way we think it is. The ego is just a twisted perception in the mind. It has no reality beyond that kind of temporary insanity in the mind. And so it's happening over and over again. But each time it's transient, it doesn't last very long. And so we can start to observe each moment that this this sickness occurs, where ego comes in. Based on that egoism, selfishness arises in one form or another. We can observe as this happens and then drops away. It happens again and then it fades away and it happens again. We can watch that as it occurs over and over again each day to start to understand what ego really is, what the self is. Is there a real self or is it just this warped illusion? And then to see how as long as the mind functions in terms of ego, life is full of positive and negative. And all that positive and negative is the basis for selfishness. So, in just these ordinary experiences of life, we can explore all this confusion of me and mine, of egoism, of selfishness. Have you ever seen a child bump into a, walking carelessly and bump into a chair and then kick the chair? Have you ever seen this kind of thing happen? Because of the, the deck bumps into the chair and there is pain. And then it's my pain, ego arises. And then from this stupidity of seeing the pain or seeing itself as ego, the child also projects ego on the chair. I'm an ego, it's an ego. And then I fight it. The child feels attacked by this other ego, and so it fights back by kicking. There are plenty of examples like this in, in ordinary life. How ego arises. Ego wasn't there at the beginning. It just arose when there was the pain. The child didn't like the pain. Ego was born. And then there's this struggle, this fighting of one ego against another ego. But what's ridiculous about the whole thing is that There's no real ego anywhere. The child is not an ego. The chair isn't an ego. This is just a ignorant way of thinking that occurs when we are careless. 
and then all kinds of selfishness and fighting, destruction and harm result from it. So in summary, we need to see that what we take to be ego or self arises just in these different experiences. That the ego is not some lasting reality or entity that's with us all the time, but it's just a certain kind of thinking that occurs when it's stirred up by certain positive and negative experiences. We need to study these facts of ego, what it is, how it arises, where it goes, so that we see that it's just just an, a delusion. It's, a, it's an illusion, which is a product of delusion. When we see the delusive nature of ego, then we understand what we need to know in life. When we see through the illusion of ego, then we understand everything in this world, including all of Buddhism. We should be able to see that the actor comes after the action. If we observe how the mind works, you'll see that the actor comes after the action. Now, children will think this is illogical because we habitually think that there needs to be someone to do something before this something happens. There needs to be an actor that's there for there to be any action. That's how we habitually think about things. But when we actually examine what's going on, instead of just believing um, blindly, we notice that first there is some action. Due to that action, there is some positive or negative that's attached to. And then the concept of an actor or the ego that acts is born. When we see this clearly enough, when we realize deeply enough that the actor comes after the action, then we have the means to remove self, to get rid of ego. When ego is gotten rid of, then there is no selfishness. Life is no longer enslaved to positive and negative. There is no selfishness. Our life is neither self-destructive or other destructive. This is the means to, to getting free, to observe the reality of ego in seeing that the actor, the ego that acts, comes after the action. The highest truth that Buddhism or that Dhamma wants us or wants us to understand is that the self is nothing but an ignorant thought in our mind. It has no, no true reality in itself. That what we consider to be self or ego or a soul is just an idea in the mind that arises temporarily. It's that arises in different situations when ignorance is at work. So the self is just a product of ignorance. It's something we imagine to exist, although it doesn't exist anywhere but in our imagination. This is the highest truth, the, the basic fact of life, that Buddhism is, that Buddhism wants us to understand. When we, and for this reason then, we study dependent origination so that we see how this illusion of ego occurs and how we buy this, this lie of ego. And then we practice mindfulness with breathing so that we have the means to, to control this 
situation so that we, to master it, so that we stop falling into this illusion, so we stop believing in the illusion of self. So by practicing, by studying dependent origination and practicing mindfulness with breathing, we have the means to free life from all egoism and selfishness. The knowledge, the understanding, the means is available to us all. You've come here in order to learn about them. We hope that you understand and will be successful in putting this into practice so that your lives can be free of all egoism and all selfishness. So in short, we can say that the life that is egoistic and selfish bites its owner. Life that is, any life that is operating with egoism and selfishness will bite its owner. But the life that is free of and beyond ego and selfishness, that life doesn't bite its owner. When, when this unselfish, this non-selfish life doesn't bite itself, then life is blissful. And that life can be truly useful for the benefit of the world. Finally, may we express our thanks that you have been very good listeners. Um, this is the end of the talk and we thank you for listening very patiently.